Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you to the next class uh, on the inorganic chemistry of life, principles and perspectives. Uh, let us just have a uh, recap of what we were doing in the last class. In the last class I was explaining you about the metal ion binding affinity of uh, alkali alkaline earth ions towards the cellular kind of a proteins. We have seen calcium 2 plus binds much more stronger than the magnesium 2 plus which is uh, which binds stronger than potassium plus which is in turn greater than that of the sodium plus. So, among all these four sodium plus is the weakest and calcium 2 plus is the strongest and their affinity would make a difference in activating the proteins accordingly. And that is what we have seen uh, in the previous class. Uh, so, calcium about in the range of 10 power 6 mole inverse, 10 power 3 for magnesium, 10 power 1 for this and sodium. Uh, 10 power minus 1. So, about 1000 fold, 100 fold and 100 fold difference. So, you have uh, quite a large fold difference between sodium and calcium and accordingly this uh, thing will reflect in their activity of the enzymes. Now, next point, let us look at a few proteins of calcium. Let us examine how these are bound, calcium 2 plus is bound. So, here is a table where I have uh, crystal structures of uh, different proteins of the calcium proteins. So, uh, and in this you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 refers to calcium site 1, calcium site 2, calcium site 3 and calcium site 4. So, there are 4 calciums are there and if you try to examine this, you would say aspartic, glutamic, aspartic, glutamic, water, aspartic, glutamic like that. So, many things. So, if you go to the uh, trypsin, glutamic, glutamic, uh, aspargin, etc. And uh, you go to phospholipase. Uh, so, this is the one where you have a less number of uh, uh, aspartic uh, or carboxylic. And look at the other uh, table, uh, the continuation of the table, paraalbumin. There are two couple, uh, the calcium centers, aspartic, aspartic, etc., etc., aspartic, 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 glutamic, and concavalin. Uh, so, you have, so we have seen several calcium 2 plus binding proteins. Uh, proteins like thermolysin, trypsin, staphylococcus nuclease, phospholipase and then we have also looked at paravalbamin, concavalin, intestinal calcium uh, buffer protein and calmodulin. So, we have seen good number of proteins to judge and justify the kind of a binding that we have. So, what is the majority you see among these? So, the majority in all this is calcium 2 plus is bound to as many number of carboxylic groups as possible and some water and a few peptide carbonyls. Primarily these are the ones. So, you can also see uh, some of the cases that uh, coordination numbers here, coordination number 6, coordination number 8 is the same protein. One center is coordination number 6, other center is coordination number 8. So, you have coordination number 6, 7 and 8 mostly that is one common point. The second common point is that the carboxylates are the major uh, binding residues. So, carboxylate uh, is, is the one which is stabilizing the calcium that is what we looked at or <coughs> the why the magnesium 2 plus is not able to activate the proteins of calcium inside the cell in spite of the fact that the calcium 2 plus concentration is low and magnesium 2 plus concentration is very high, still they will not perturb the proteins of the calcium because of this particular region. The reason we have already seen that earlier uh, spotting glutamic, uh, you have a post translational modification of introducing carboxylic groups and such carboxylic groups are responsible for binding to calcium. And we could see here example from all these uh, 7, 8 different proteins that we have examined, several calcium uh, centers we have examined. The maximum binding is from the carboxylate and sometimes carboxylate may be more indentate, sometimes it may be bindentate, those kind of differences possible. But nevertheless, this is the carboxylate rich. So, therefore, the carboxylate rich is the main point to differentiate 
the calcium versus the magnesium therefore the magnesium ions cannot activate the proteins of calcium. I hope you understand the difference between the magnesium and calcium. Okay, then let, let us look at the uh, some uh, proteins in little more into calcium modulation. So, cal and modulation is modulin, so cal modulin. Cal modulin is nothing but the uh, modulation of the calcium, the control of the calcium. Okay. So, calcium modulated protein. Okay, calcium binding messenger protein expressed in all eukaryotic cells that is absolutely present in uh, almost every eukaryotic cells. So, binding of calcium 2 plus is required for act the activation of the calmodulin. This is important. Just look at one of the calmodulin over here. So, the calmodulin over here you have a calcium binding center here and then other calcium binding centers over there. And if you open up this region and see it's which is shown over here, the this is one helix, this is a helix. So, helix, helix, the red helix, the blue helix and the green is a loop, the green is a loop. So, in this loop you can see count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 uh, <coughs> coordinations are directed towards the calcium. So, it is a 7 coordinated calcium in the loop region of the calmodulin that is an important parameter to be noticed. Now, uh, you can see the same in a little better clarity here calcium is here in the center the all these reds the 5 in one plane and 2 in the other it is called pentagonal bipyramidal. So, in calmodulin calcium is bound like a pentagonal bipyramidal kind of a structure. So, I hope uh, you understand uh, things in this. So, how the calcium binds to the calmodulin because in turn the calmodulin is involved in uh, interacting activating various uh, uh, enzymes as well. And let us see in the next slide. See once uh, bound to the calcium 2 plus to the calmodulin it is a part of uh, part and parcel for uh, introducing the signal transduction pathway. So, therefore, the calcium uh, introduces the signal uh, transduction pathway and how it does that? It does because it modifies its interactions with various targeted target proteins. What are the kinds of proteins that it gets? Uh, it is targeting, it is targeting in kinases, targeting in phosphatases. What will happen? What is a kinase? What we learn kinase means? Kinase means phosphorylation. So, phosphorylating enzyme. Phosphatase means phosphate hydrolysis, phosphate removal hydrolysis uh, enzyme. So, that means when the calcium binds to the calmodulin and it brings uh, a kind of a signal trans transduction pathway by interacting with a variety of target proteins and these target proteins are nothing but kinases and phosphatases. That means entire business here is adding a phosphate, removing a phosphate, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, phosphorylation dephosphorylation. Why you think? Because when you phosphorylate a protein, the protein uh, uh, conformation will change, protein properties will change. When you dephosphorylate similarly, the protein conformation and the properties uh, subsequently or consequently changes. So, that is what is an important aspect therefore. So, though the calcium is binding to this, it creates all these impulses kind of thing. So, that is signal transducing. Okay. So, as a result of such a kind of a manipulations done by the calcium concentration or calcium binding to calmodulin, so there are variety of processes in our body which we are aware of inflammation we know, metabolism, apoptosis, muscle contraction, intracellular movement, short term and long term memory and the immune response. So, for all of these functions of the body the calcium calmodulin role is very important via kinases and phosphatases, via kinases and phosphatases. Okay. So, that means the signal transduction is takes its own path going via kinases and phosphatases. So, here is the one where the calcium uh, 2 plus uh, is chelated uh, by the ligand uh, of the 12 residue loop we have seen in the previous slide. You can see once again over there and this is the calcium. And this protein 
Now it can activate kinase, we said it will activate kinase, it will activate phosphatase, it will deactivate also when it comes out. So let us say kinase, MLC kinase, MLC is not important, it is a kinase. So the kinase how it is, now look at this very carefully, there is one uh, uh, alpha helical, a loop, alpha helical, a loop, alpha helical, a loop, alpha helical, that is your MLC. And you see inside there are two dark spots here and then alpha helix green, alpha helix red, alpha helix blue and this particular two ions. This is nothing but calmodulin. So, this calmodulin just embraces with that of the kinase. Now, the kinase gets activated. So, you understand there are two proteins in this. One is you just follow what I am showing here. This is one protein and the that is the calmodulin and the outer is the other which is the kinase. So, kinase and calmodulin interact together to activate the kinase part of it to this. That is how they modify, they target the enzymes such as kinases and phosphatases. As a result of that, kinase will do phosphorylation, phosphatase will do dephosphorylation. And then, so that is that is where the properties of the proteins will change basically essentially. I hope you understand. So, the same thing let us see in a slightly different way. So, when the calcium binds into these things, then it will activate uh, activated kinases or activated enzymes. So, once the kinase is activated, it will add phosphate groups to various proteins. When it adds the phosphate group groups to various proteins, the protein functions will change. So, therefore, the entire story of this not necessary to understand each and every part of this one. All that you need to say is that when the calcium cal, uh, through the calmodulin interacts with these proteins uh, called kinases and phosphatases that will induce a path uh, of uh, uh, reactions. So, therefore, calcium these are all called calcium stimulated pathway. So, in this particular case example is calcium stimulated adenyl, adenylyl cyclase pathway. So, like that you have several. What one needs to understand from this? It will activate a kinase, then kinase will add uh, phosphate group to proteins when the phosphate group is added then the uh, properties will change ok. And some other proteins let us say uh, phosphate proteins if they do it that, that means phosphorylate phosphate hydrolysis will be activated that will be in some other case. So, example is just shown over here and this is what we were talking about calcium signal transduction pathway this whole thing is calcium signal transduction pathway via activating deactivating the kinases and phosphatases. Now, let us look at calcium where it binds there will be some change. So, where it binds if the change transfers from there it is the primary kind of a messenger. On the other hand the calcium binds uh, here and then it is transported to this and then there is some signal comes out or some message comes out or some response comes out then that is called secondary messenger understand that. So, binding is over here, response is coming from over here. So, that is secondary messenger that is because this binding of this will go through some transformation that will activate one more thing and the signal comes. It is not that direct binding of the calcium bringing the signal that is called primary messenger part of it and if it goes through via, via cycles and then gives the response then it is the basically the calcium as a secondary uh, messenger. So, okay. So, primary is coming activating this one, secondary giving a signal out of this one. So, actually it enters here, it activates here and gives the signal. So, therefore, entry and the signal are two different process that is the secondary messenger. So, you have an outer membrane this yellow portion and the inner membrane you have the uh, grey kind of a portion so that you have and that is what refers to. So, when you have an interaction of the calcium in the outer membrane and if the signal comes from the inner membrane that is what is a secondary uh, messenger of the calcium. So, calcium can give a straight, straight away uh, response, it can also give a response through which is called secondary messenger properties. The same thing is shown over here where you have a calcium entering into that, calcium goes through all this and then gets into uh, endoplasmic reticulum. So, therefore, that is where uh, thing. So, all that we uh, uh, understand from this is calcium can act as a 
primary messenger, it also can act as a secondary messenger. So, therefore, now you have seen calcium can activate chylmodulin and do large number of uh, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation kind of things. Calcium can give a primary messenger uh, output, it can also give secondary messenger output. Now, if you put all of them into, uh, into an action, you will get an example, example of calcium stimulation in neuromuscular action. So, neuron versus the muscle interface. So, at the new neuron versus the muscle interface, the calcium plays a role in terms of the calcium, uh, in terms of the muscular contraction or muscular uh, activity. So, this is because there is some action potential which results in opening of the calcium 2 plus gate channel and once that is opened here, is, uh, here and that will bring an influx of the calcium 2 plus uh, and this results in this brings in influx you see that these are all calcium uh, coming in and this influx of the calcium 2 plus results in the acetylcholine neurotransmitter is acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter and that means it generates the uh, the signal of the acetylcholine so that is the primary and then vesicle these vesicles are released in the synaptic uh, cleft so this part is the synaptic cleft so so you have a calcium coming in then uh, acetylcholine uh, uh, neurotransmitter coming in and that enters into the uh, into the synaptic uh, cleft and then something comes out so acetylcholine binds to the uh, nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors here at this stage. At this stage, it will bind to the receptors, acetylcholine receptors and that triggers the calcium 2 plus ion channels uh, to open. So, th all this results in action potential and this whole thing will result in a muscle contraction. So, now you understand a primary signal effect and the secondary signal effect, primary messenger, secondary messenger. The calcium coming into that releasing the acetylcholine and the acetylcholine reaching this uh, region of the synaptic region and where uh, this will basically bind to the receptors of the acetylcholine and that will result in flow of the calcium ions uh, this and which will change the potential or action potential and that will make the change in the uh, neuromuscular aspect or muscular uh, con contraction. So, this is just to demonstrate how a primary and secondary uh, you know signals, a primary and secondary uh, sig messenger signals released by the calcium binding or calcium release uh, is to demonstrate that this example is taken, not to uh, teach the biology of neuromuscular action. The idea is not to teach the biology of neuromuscular action, but to say how a metal ion flow our metal ion concentration can trigger many things. As you can see here, the initial input of influx of calcium generates the acetylcholine neurotransmitter and, the, and this uh, neurotransmitter will bind at the uh, synaptic cleft to the receptor and this will open the ch uh, gate or channel and that will change the concentration of the uh, calcium and thereby you have an action potential changing. So, you can see that primary uh, <coughs> messenger effect as well as the secondary messenger effect is very, very interesting. Uh, there are hardly any examples of this kind uh, in the bioinorganic chemistry or biological inorganic chemistry of life at all. So, this brings into the arena where we have seen the ions going through. So, the ions going through are uh, giving some messenger properties. So, therefore, one needs to look at the transport of ions. Also, we have seen earlier uh, the concentrations of the sodium outside, inside, concentrations of the potassium inside and outside, concentration of the magnesium inside and outside, similarly calcium. So, that uh, also we understood that one needs to have a mechanism in the biological systems to, to maintain their concentrations. All this brings in a phenomena called transportation of ions, transport of ions. Now, let us look at the transport of ions, particularly the transport of alkali and alkaline ions. When you transport something, do you need uh, energy or not? I am sure you know when you want to transport anything, you need energy. So, you hire a vehicle, the, the guy will use the petrol and then transport your things from one place to the other, obviously energies. 
And suppose you don't want to pay for it, you want to carry yourself, but your body energy also is uh, uh, there. Now, take another example. Uh, take a, there is a, there is a quite a good flow of water, and uh, you keep a tire and sit on this, and that moves. Do you need energy there? No, there is no energy required there. So there is certain transport. So you are but you are moving from one side in a river to other side as per the flow of the river. So therefore there there is no energy put by you. But in the other case when you carry something you are putting your body energy or biological energy or when you carry it by uh, a transporting vehicle then you are using in the form of uh, uh, fuel. So therefore you have transport processes where energy is involved and there are also transport process where energy is not involved. So just now I said that there is a flowing water in river and uh, so you just take a tire and sit on top of that. So you, therefore you are floating uh, because of the tire and the water surface and the water surface you move without any of your effort. There is no energy that is being spent. So similarly transport of ions in the biological system also has got both these kind of things. So those which do not require energy but ions are transported, those which require energy uh, also ions are transported, very important we have to look at. So transport of ions in the biological systems can be done without spending any energy or uh, can also be of course done with the spending of energy. Whenever we say talk about the energy in the biological system it is ATP. What is ATP synthesis that means energy is synthesized, ATP hydrolysis energy is consumed. So, whenever you have used your energy that means your ATP is hydrolyzed and whenever you have gained your energy means you have uh, synthesized the ATP. So, ATP synthesis, ATP uh, hydrolysis in fact this kind of a thing which also used in transporting or phosphorylating things is the maximum kind of energy that is being used in our body system. So, body continuously synthesizes continuously uses ATP. Okay. Now let us come to the how can you have a transport of ions without spending any energy. If it can be there that is called passive transport and if you require energy it is called active transport. How can you have a, a, a transport without energy? I am sure you must have studied a very basic uh, electricity experiment that is you have two ends of uh, the uh, the two rods connected by electrical circuit and where you apply a potential for one and one of the electrode and you can connecting uh, in the connecting wire you put an ammeter you can see the current is flowing. So from a high voltage to low voltage which the current flows. Similarly you take a huge rod heat on one end let us say you take you have taken one meter iron rod and you heat only on one end you take one end and heat it up uh, in, a, uh, in a flame and its temperature is very high. And you check on the other end slowly you would start seeing the other end also start getting heated up uh, uh, even if you have stopped your heating on this side. So this is, so you are not heating that side but the temperature is raised. So how the energy, heat energy is being flowing without uh, putting any kind of an energy barrier that is because heat flows from high temperature to low temperature, current flow flows from higher potential to the lower potential. Similarly, ions will flow, flow from a higher concentration to lower concentration. After all, ions having a charge, higher concentration means higher potential. Uh, ions which are having less number of ions, less concentration, therefore less potential. Therefore, you have a greater potential, you have a lesser potential, therefore the ions are dragged out of from higher potential to the lower potential. Now, that is what the driving force is, but no energy is spent. I hope in this example of the uh, current flowing between the two you know systems where the potential difference is maintained and also heat flowing between uh, two ends of a rod where the temperature difference is there then this uh, flows without any kind of energy. So similarly the ions which are having a greater concentration, greater flux and these ions will move towards a lower concentration because that will be a lower potential. I hope you understand ions can flow without the energy 
Of course, the ions can flow with energy. For example, here, example is shown over there, calcium going through all this. Uh, how do we know it is, uh, it is uh, having the energy? We know because, uh, we know because ATP is uh, used and ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphorus, uh, inorganic phosphorus is referred as PI. In the entire course, when I show PI means phosphate, in other words, it is also called inorganic phosphate. Uh, uh, inorganic phosphate. Biological chemists generally refer to that as a fondly as a inorganic phosphate. Okay? ATP to ADP, one phosphate is less. So, phosphate is hydrolyzed. Okay? So, that is where thing is. Now, so this we have started talking about the transportation of ions without the energy, with the energy consumption. Now, see some few things. There is some ion, let us say here, this ion going through the membrane going through one side. Suppose if the only this ion goes from this to this, it is called uniport. Uniport means one direction transport. And here there is an example, you will understand this by doing that. There is an arrow for this which is shown over this side and there is an arrow for this red one shown over this side. So, that means as this species goes in, this species will also go in. So, as the blue circles go in, these red triangles will also go in. Okay. So, that means both are going from this side to this side. That is called synergistic transport. In other words, in short form, it is called symport. Synergistic transport called symport. So, A is going in this direction, B is also going in the direction. Because of the A is going, B is also going. In other words, the transport of A is coupled with B and such a kind of transports are called the symports. Now, there is the next example exactly reverse. This one is going in this direction, this red is going in the other direction. So, but these are coupled. This uh, the uh, uh, spherical one going in this way from outside to inside and this red one going from inside to outside. These two are coupled and this is called antipod because the directions are different. Here symport because the directions are same direction and here only one ion uniport. So, you can have a uniport, you can have a symport, you can have an antiport. Okay? So, these are all some things why I am telling is all of these are observed in biological systems. Just you will see in a while the examples for, uh, for many of these or most of these or all of these. Okay, the same thing is shown over there uh, in another uh, depiction uniport this you take this uh, uh, hatched line as the membrane and left side is the outside, right side is the inside. Going from this to this, one ion going uniport, two ions, two different ions are going in the same direction symport, one ion going in this direction, another ion is going in the other direction is called antiport. It can be ion, it can be molecule, it can be any species, it is not necessary only ion. So, this transport could be any of these things too. So, same thing is shown over uh, here when you talk about the, the uh, sodium ions going inside that will also take glucose. If two sodium go ions are goes inside, it also takes one uh, uh, glucose here. This is an actual example. Let us change the electrical uh, potential in this. Okay? Uh, and uh, so, uh, then here you take one sodium inside and from inside you take one proton inside. What is happening? One positive charge came inside, one positive charge go, uh, went outside. So, what does this mean? The charge no change in the charges. So, no net change in the uh, in the case of the this is no net change in the potential. Okay? So, two cations are coming inside, one neutral molecule therefore, potential is changed because the psi function will change. Here, one sodium cation came inside, one cation went outside, so therefore no change. Here there are no protons changing, so no pH change. Here the protons is changed, so pH is changed. So these also got uh, re interchanged. Okay? So what we have to say here first this thing is yes and this is no and this is no and this is yes. Okay? So you, you can understand you can change even the pH too, it can change the potential. Only the ions which are uh, showing that uh, will uh, will have 
uh, this one. So, two ions going in one uh, glucose molecule therefore, the potential is different and uh, one ion going in this direction other uh, equivalent charge ion going outside no change. But since it is a proton which is going outside the pH will differ from inside to the outside. Okay. So, therefore, so, uh, so ion pumps are actively coupled to metabolic pathways which I will explain later on when I come to the sodium potassium ATPase etc or calcium uh, magnesium LTPases. Okay. So, there, there is these are a energy coupled processes. Okay. So, here it is idea is to say no change in the potential, no change in the pH, there is uh, no change in the potential sorry in the first one change in the potential no pH change, the second one uh, no change in the potential, but change in the pH. So, that means this ion transport is not just a simple uh, phenomena and this particular phenomena is taken uh, uh, brings a lot of changes in the properties of this and therefore, the properties of these uh, things are uh, managed uh, uh, in this. Okay. So, you can see coupling uh, in E. coli simple uh, simplest uh, organism E. coli. So, in the E. coli you can see let us say this is the E. coli surface then you can see here is something uh, coming in here the H plus is coming in here. So, you can call this as a UD port and here H plus is going uh, out K plus is coming in what is the, what do you call this one? It is called antiport, it is called antiport. So, potassium is going out what do you call this? UD port and here two protons are going out uh, calciums are going in. So, this is again antiport and charges two charges in two charges out no net change in the potential, but because two protons are going out this process can change the pH. Okay. Similarly, calcium with this. So, different processes that we can talk about. So, as you can see some other process will change the potential, some of them will change the potential and the pH, some of them will not change the potential, but changes only pH. So, therefore, if you have a system where all of these are coupled together, you, see, you can see how complicated an ion transport or molecular transport system in a human. This is only for one cell, as you call a small cell. So, the ATP is nigericin, valnomycin, A23187, CHEA, respiratory chain, these are the items that you have. All that you need to know is what is going in, what is coming out, what will happen, will there be change in the potential, will there be change in the pH. So, that is what I explained to you, you can do your own exercise. So, after this we will continue with the transport phenomena uh, in the next class. Thank you very much.